the, the the legacy of this show, I mean, is incredible to think after 20 years. But when when going into it, uh, you know, back back way back when at this point, I mean, did you have any sort of feelings or ideas that it would carry on as far as it would um, if we uh, maybe Melissa, then Wendy and then Bo and Steve? Yeah, you know, I, I a couple of us have 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 talked about this um, the, on the very first day. Well, on my very first recording day of the show, Mary Elizabeth took me into a, a screening room with a big, huge screen in it. She said, "You know what? Before we do anything, I want you just to watch the opening titles of this project that we are about to embark on." And. <laughs> And I watched it and I like my jaw dropped and I thought, oh, my God, this is the coolest music I have ever heard. Sorry, I hear sirens. Um, but um, this is the coolest music. What is this show? And then I watched. She let me watch a little bit of it and just the style of it, the look of it, the, the characters, the music, which we all call the fifth member of the bebop. The music is like so integral but um to be in the studio you know 20 years ago and then to be here with you 20 years later it, it it's a little bit mind-blowing and but it, it's an incredible feeling knowing that we were a part of something that that has has been crossing through generations and um that we were able to create these characters um and bring them to life uh, it was such a very very special and unique show and and so ahead in so many ways um that it stands the test of time so um it, it doesn't feel dated and um that's what i that's what i keep hearing that you know it doesn't feel dated it it, it could still be that anime that is your first anime like which one should you watch oh watch cowboy bebop when i hear people People say that I I still get like that that warm fuzzy feeling. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah, I I just remember feeling like this this show stands apart from anything else we've done. It was unlike any other anime I'd seen. It was unlike any animation from the U.S. as well. It was all uh, really designed for an adult audience. And I thought, oh, this is like something I can sink my teeth into. This is going to have substance. It's not just stereotypical, especially for the female roles. Um, but think about what we were working on at the time. We had been doing Digimon. I was working on Mysterious Play, which seemed to go on forever, which had a very... Um, complicated storyline to me, at least the scenes that I was in, it, when you put it all together, it was very difficult to follow. It wasn't a linear storytelling sort of vehicle. And what else? We were working on, um, I'm trying to think of all the shows at that time. I just thought of another one. Um, I wish I could give you more examples because when you put Bebop in the mix, it stands apart in every way from everything else that we had been working on. And Mind you, this is pre-video game years. We were not getting additional roles in video games where really hardcore, aggressive, developed characters started becoming available to us to really sink our teeth into. Uh, at the time, it was much more about, um, honestly, boxes that most characters fit into. In fact, I hear that there's something like a nine character type uh, archetype of characters that most anime characters are designed off of, these characters broke the mold. And it was obvious that that's what was going on. And it felt like there was a uh, an American Western storyteller involved. And it paid such homage and respect to our rock and roll roots in the US. And that was just something we could instantly relate to. And I thought this show is the vehicle I dreamed of, something that's gonna be that edgy and that real and is gonna take it to the next level. So we were just hopeful that people would get a chance to see it. We didn't know where it would end up, much less continuing to play all these years. <laughs> Right, we didn't we didn't know um, that it would have the legacy that it has, and it was it was a fun gig, you know, it was a fun gig. But as time went on, I started I, I began to realize how special it was, but it didn't it didn't hit me right away. And um, 
one of the things I loved about the way Jet was written, that he was vulnerable. You know, there's so much macho going on in it that, you know, I come from a very macho background and um, t too often characters are like totally macho with no vulnerability. And I, I enjoyed the fact that, that he was vulnerable. He, he, uh, he professed that he didn't care when Faye and, and Spike left the bebop, you know, doesn't matter to me. I'm glad they're gone, you know? And, uh, but you could see through that this, this guy was, was vulnerable. He was dependent upon them. They were his family. And then when it was written where he went back to, to Ganymede, um, it really completed it for me because he, you know, he went back to uh, put his other life uh, to rest uh, and, you know, to toss the watch away. And it was, it was just like real stuff. I mean, it was, it was real. And uh, it was emotional for me uh, to, to voice it. And uh, that was one of the special aspects of, 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 of voicing, voicing Jet uh, because he was, he was vulnerable and there was a lot of just real uh, emotion that he exhibited and, or experienced uh, that I, I really enjoyed portraying. Back at that time, we didn't have social media. We didn't have internet. We, most of us didn't even have a decent computer. So we didn't get feedback on the work that we had done other than the occasional fan that might reach out to us or my experience going to a convention back then was a bunch of suburbs versus dubbers and getting my life threatened. <laughs> and so to, to get to work on something like this, I didn't have any expectations at all, but we knew that it was something very special. And Mary Elizabeth and I talk about this all the time, that we just wanted to make the best show we possibly could. And we didn't want to screw it up because it was so beautiful and perfect the way it was before we even got a hold of it. So uh, we made it for us with, with all the love and integrity that we possibly could inject into it. And to see that people resonated all these years later was the most amazing surprise and continues to surprise me that it, it carries on generation after generation to the point where now it's expanding into a different genre completely. So since Steve, you bring it up, I mean, subbing versus dubbing is still to this day, quite the heated conversation in anime viewing. And since all of you have made such great careers from the dubbing work alongside other animation fields, I mean, what is it to you, each of you, that you find is both challenging and rewarding for, you know, helping bring so many different works such as Bebop to Western viewers through your dubbing? Mm. Mm. I'm always aware of that burden and, and goal and responsibility and uh, take it with great honor. And I constantly am working on uh, both sides of the mic as far as directing, adapting, performing, and honoring um, the art form and advancing it is super important to me. And I think that we've all had a great opportunity to do that. And I think it is it is a, a bit of a burden, but it also is a throwdown. It's a challenge. And I think that's why we're still challenged by the art form. It's still an amazing feat to be able to reproduce a performance that's completed and done and make it sound like it comes from a whole different language and that that's how the production was meant to be. So that in, in our case, it was meant to be in English and that's just the way we play it. And we expect the quality, the quality of what we do to rise to that uh, goal. Um, but I think being able to put our mark on, on that as technicians, I mean, this is a very right brain, left brain discipline. It requires a ton of creativity and that's the wide appeal for all the many, many people that want to get into voiceover. But there is a, another 50% of the work that is techno, very technologically based. It's, it's technique and it's technology. And it's like reading our scripts, our ADR scripts is very much like reading music. We insert pauses like rests and music. We have dialogue that's on camera, off camera. So there's a lot that the actor's juggling and then has to put it through their filter as an actor and then produce uh, the final outcome that has to be convincing and be believable and real. So, you know, creating dramas and comedies and, and slices of life one line at a time and threading them all together to create one beautiful created artwork um, is tedious, 
super demanding. You've got to be on it. Like as soon as you show up to a session and you're a little fatigued or you're hurting about something or you haven't been able to leave it at the door, your team's going to know it in a minute. They may not know what it is, but they'll know something's off. So there's a lot of intuition that comes into play as well. That is so true, Wendy. You know, it, it, it really, really is. And um, I, I especially appreciate that you, 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 <laughs> God bless um, that you that that you said that this was an art form because it it truly truly is to be an actor and to be a voice actor and then to be a voice actor who works in anime and in dubbing it there it's really an art form and it, and it really is being a technician and and being able to use those qualities and i I so appreciate that you said that because it it really it really is that and it is a lot of pressure and it is very demanding to to you know it's not just a cakewalk to go in and and dub and have that musicality and that timing and to be able to bring a character to life right away um, that might already have its stamp on well that it does already have a stamp on it from an original voice so um you know coming back to bebop the fact that we were able to put a stamp on these characters and the fact that these characters have cut through and this show is still stands and it is still so so powerful and, and resonates so strongly um it it really is gratifying as an actor to know that we were able to do that and in any job that you take you take them as seriously you you take each job and you put everything into it um but it's not always the case that you're here 20 years later (laughs) and what we do we know is like forever Right. It is. <laughs> what right. we do is forever, yeah. and um, and we know that the, the the subtitlers are out there, and and they're ready to jump on us, <laughs> and then jump on our work. So uh, the yeah. AI talent. That's what I'm hearing so much about. Sorry, Bo. <laughs> no, no, no. I I, I I totally understand. And uh, I one of the things I do get is that periodically that subject comes up: dubs versus subs. And uh, and th- invariably they come down on the side of of dubs for bebop, and they distinguish bebop from a lot of other projects. I'm a purist. I like subs, mm-hmm. but I will watch the cowboy bebop dub. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Back then uh, we didn't do it for the money. We still don't really do it for the money because every other area of entertainment pays so much more. We were talking about this earlier. <laughs> no residuals. I mean, there's. There's a lot of reasons not to do this work if you're already a successful actor. But being uh, part of the convention circuit and being able to interact with the fans and, and understanding how much this means to them fuels me to want to continue doing anime. And it also keeps our skills sharp. Like like everybody was saying, it is a very technical skill set, and I don't want to lose that. And uh, I would much rather do that in anime than in like background work on a TV show. I've done a lot of looping for TV shows. It's stressful. It's backbiting. Anime is just that it feels like a warm, loving hug every time we go into that booth like this. It's it's, it's yeah. cushy. It's warm. And it's a very personal, intimate experience, like Wendy was saying, too, where most of the time we're just working with ourselves, the director, and the engineer, and that's it. And it's an amazing experience. Uh, intimate experience that translates out there in the world hopefully that can lift somebody up on the other end Mm -hmm. so i know when it comes to acting uh, especially with characters that have been portrayed before a lot of actors when they come into the role they want to look for their own take on it as much as staying true to the source material so with the live action show coming up i'm curious have you heard from each of your respective live action stars for (laughs) advice or thoughts or have you or do you have thoughts on on those who were chosen for your respective characters i'm i'm available anytime daniela call me (laughs) (laughs) i actually stalked john cho a little bit when i found out that he had the role i i reached out to him and he actually responded and uh I'd like to call him a friend. I don't know if he considers me that yet, but we've had a few little digital conversations. And I was actually supposed to go out and 
meet the cast in New Zealand when they were first starting to film and then he broke his leg. I was in New Zealand for a convention, missed him by like three days. So I never had that opportunity to do that and um, put it out there that I'm available if he wanted to talk about anything. But I'm kind of glad that he didn't because I feel like he's going to bring his own unique presence to the character. And I'm very curious to see what he does with that. Mm -hmm. That's what we do as actors that when we have a role, whether it's on camera or, or, or a voiceover, that we, we try to find uh, where we meld with the character. Bo, how Bo melds with Jet, uh, the commonality there. And, um, and I think that in line with what Steve said, I'm anxious to see uh, what he brings to, to, to Jet that's part of him. Not mimicking me at all, but that's what's part of him. So I'm, I'm really anxious and excited to, to see what he does. I think that's what it's all about as actors and about artists. You want to support each other and you want to lift each other up. And, and you know, we have to feel good that, you know, what we've done in the genre that we've done with Cowboy Bebop, um, you know, it, it, it's done something great. So much so that, hey, now they're doing a live action version and whatever that version is, it's going to be amazing. And, you know, we have to honor that, what they're doing and, and say, oh, my God, that's fantastic. I can't wait to see what they do. I can't wait to see what they're going to do with Edward. You know, that's like the big mystery. And I'm so excited to see what they do. So I'm all for it and supporting it. And I want them to succeed because if they succeed, we succeed in the whole family of Cowboy Bebop succeeds and, and I'm all for it. <laughs>